Shabbat Shalom and welcome to the first casual Shabbat of 2018. We invite and welcome everybody to dress a little more casually than they might otherwise uh, all the way through August. And in case the temperature gets hot out there at, at some point, I hear it will, then, uh, then we're ready for it. So, so Shabbat Shalom. Rebecca, the kids and I are just back from a wonderful up north adventure. So thank you everyone for allowing us the opportunity to go away. From Sunday through uh, just yesterday, we were up north. We made it from here to Drummond Island, and then we headed west into the, through the Upper Peninsula, making it all the way to Munising and Pictured Rocks, made it back, spent Thursday night in Harbor Springs, completed our circle yesterday. It was a wonderful trip. Thank you for the opportunity to get away for a few days to get refreshed. And I have to spe say a special thank you to Rebecca, who apparently has heard enough sermons about me camping. That the Holiday Inn in Munising was beautiful. I think you should check it out. I encourage everybody. And all of the hikes we went on were perfect because there was a wooded pathway marking the whole way. You didn't actually have to touch the dirt even. There was a wood deck right above. And at the end of every hike that we went on, was an ice cream shop and a gift shop. This was my kind of roughing it, folks. As you make your way into the gift shop, and I really enjoy the, the wit on every t-shirt uh, that's there, and they create this picture of a way. Because ap after all, the entire up north experience in Michigan is about getting away. So the shirt that I think we saw the most said, uh, it was a picture of, of Michigan highlighting all of the Great Lakes, and it said, no salt, no sharks, no worries. Saw another picture of a, uh, a bear. Hold, did you know there are bears in UP? I didn't see one, thank God. Would have been my last UP adventure, but there were bears in the UP, and so there, on this t-shirt, there was a picture of a bear holding a hiker upside down by his ankle. And this bear was handing the hiker back to another bear. And the caption at the bottom said, do you have one that's gluten free? <laughs> that I think was for the Jewish hikers going up there. And then of course there was a, another shirt that said, authentic youper. And this is the one I wanted to get for Rebecca. It said, authentic youper, I'd rather be lost in the woods than found in the city. But if we look at all of these Upper Peninsula and even Northern Michigan shirts, they're all creating this idea, this image of, of being away, of getting away from everything. And that is really the UP experience, that's the up north Michigan idea, is that when you get on I-75 and you cross that 45th parallel, somehow you can leave all of your troubles behind, all your tsuris, all your worries, all the affairs of the world get left behind. And I joke that when I tell the congregation my cell phone doesn't work so well up north, it's because when you get to some parts of the UP, the cell phone doesn't actually work. And it's a blessing. And you can really get away from everything. I was reflecting on that as we come to our Torah portion this week, Parashat Chukah. And here we are in the midst of the book of Numbers and we're some 38 years through our ancestors wandering through the wilderness. And as the Midrash says, they didn't have to change their clothes once, they didn't have to change their shoes once. After decades of wandering from Egypt toward the promised land through the wilderness of Sinai, because God made a miracle happen, they didn't have to worry about changing anything. It all just rejuvenated itself. God made sure they had enough food, they had enough water. Everything that they needed was provided for. And of course, how many times do we read throughout the Torah these years of wandering that Moshe or that Aaron or that Miriam started to look a little older than they once did? After all, if you look through some of our pictures of Rebecca, the kids and me going on these up north trips, you can actually watch my hairline receding and the gray coming in. Whether it's from the up north trip or not, you can decide that on your own. But this is only after some years you can see the aging process. Yet never once do we read of Moshe Rabbeinu or of Miriam Hanabiah or of Aaron Kohen, of Moses, Miriam, or Aaron, that they aged. 
perhaps they thought that they too, because of their holiness, could get a reprieve, could get an up north, if you will, from that reality which strikes all of us. That reality which, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're from the United States of America or any country in the world, the one reality we have in common, death. So we could understand if Moses, Miriam, and Aaron felt almost immune from that. After all, they spent every moment of their lives serving God and strengthening the Jewish people. It never said that their shoes wore out, their clothes wore out, they had no mirrors, so perhaps they didn't even see themselves aging. And so we could understand if Moses, Miriam, and Aaron thought that they were immune from death itself. And so we come this week to this week's Torah portion, Parshat Khan. We read of the ritual of the red heifer and how our ancestors were to cleanse themselves, cleanse themselves from an encounter with death. Thereupon we read at the end of our Torah portion of the death of Aaron, the high priest. And we read about the death of Miriam, the prophetess. And of course, right after that, the people complain that there is no water, so the Midrash says that Miriam was the one responsible as they traveled through the wilderness for finding the water wherever they went. We read of Miriam's death. And then right away thereupon, the people complain that there's no water. God tells Moses to speak to the rock so that water should pour forth. Of course, what does Moses do? He strikes the rock. And as a result of him striking the rock in this anger, God says to Moses, you are not going to reach the promised land. You, like every one of your generation, will die out before entering Eretz Yisrael, except, of course, for Caleb and Joshua. In this week's Torah portion, Parashat Chukat, even the most significant leaders of the Jewish people perhaps ever to live, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, encounter the same fate that awaits all of us around the world, death. Despite the fact that they may have believed that they were immune from it, they too faced the same reality. Death comes into the world in the book of Genesis. And though we read from Parashat Chukat today, I'm going to invite you to turn with me, if you will, in your Eitz Chaim Kumashim, to the third chapter of the book of Genesis. may be found on page 17. And as we turn back to Genesis, we discover the reality of mortality, of death. Now you remember that God placed Adam and Eve in the midst of a garden. And in the middle of that garden, which was full of all sorts of different kinds of trees, perhaps it looked a little bit like the Upper Peninsula. You be the judge of that. But in the middle of that garden, God placed two specific kinds of trees. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now which one did God tell Adam and Eve not to eat from? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. But if they ate from the tree of life, they would gain immortality. That didn't cause God any concern. God didn't prohibit them from eating of the tree of life. But God did prohibit them from eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So here we are on page 17, the midst of chapter 3. We read by Yush Nehem Arumim Adam Bishto. The two of them were naked, the man and his wife. Yet they felt no shame. Now the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild beasts that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And of course we know that the snake ultimately dupes Eve into eating of the fruit. The serpent said to the woman, You're not going to die, but God knows that as soon as you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like divine beings who know good and bad. What separates the heavenly creatures from the earthly creatures? Morality, the knowledge of good and bad, a higher level of consciousness. When the woman saw that the tree was good for eating and a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable as a source of wisdom, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And here in a wonderful play on the Hebrew, it switches from 
uh, pardon me, that they, the eyes of the both of them were open and they perceived that they were naked. They went from Arum to Arur, naked to cursed. They perceived that they were naked and they sewed together fig leaves and made themselves loincloths. The first thing that they realize as part of their wisdom now, their newfound higher sense of good and bad, was a sense of shame as a result of their nakedness. Then, of course, the Torah says that Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God moving about in the garden at the breezy time of day. And we read on pages 20 and 21 of the punishment that God gave to the snake and to Adam and Eve for disobeying what God had told of them. And now I'm on page 22, verse 20. The man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made garments of skins for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Now that man has become like one of us, knowing good and bad, what if he should stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever? Now God seemingly wasn't concerned with us eating from the tree of life before we ate from the tree of knowledge of good and bad. Right, the prohibition was very clear that while there were these two special trees in the middle of God, Eden, in the middle of the Garden of Eden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God was most concerned that we would eat from the tree of, life, of knowledge of good and evil. God did not prohibit us from eating of the tree of life. But sure enough, as soon as we ate from the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, now God is afraid of us gaining immortality. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to till the soil from which he was taken. He drove the man out and stationed east of the Garden of Eden, the cherubim and the fiery, ever-turning sword to guard the way to the tree of life. What happens here? How can it be that our morality is connected to our mortality? What is it about our knowledge of good and evil that is tied up so intricately with our need to die? I was wrestling with that. And I'll invite you, because I don't know that I have all the answers to this question, so I'll invite you to join me in wrestling. What is the connection between morality and mortality? Could it be that in order to gain a true sense of right and wrong, we have to have an awareness of our own finitude in this earth? Or perhaps could it be that as a result of our awareness of good and bad, of right and wrong, we have to be aware that others will experience this great tragedy, which is death? And perhaps, perhaps, it's our job to spare them from it? But no man and no woman is spared from death. So perhaps this idea of morality being connected to mortality means in this short span of years we are on this earth, we have an obligation to care for our fellow man and woman in a different way. It's a challenge that I don't have all the answers to. But we know if we come back to our Torah portion this week, Parshat Hukan, and God says to Moses, nevertheless, after 38 years of leading our ancestors and of giving them all of these commandments, of being the most important spokesperson for God on earth that there ever was, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, does not have an opportunity to enter the promised land. And from a human basis, we would have understood if Moses just kind of gave up at that point. If Moses said, okay, I'm not the one who's going to lead the Israelites the rest of the way, into the promised land. You know what? Put someone else in charge of them now. But that's not what Moses does. Moses continues leading the Israelites up until the very moment that they're ready to enter the promised land. And even though Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses has been told that he will not make it to that next stage, he nevertheless gives us what is now known as the book of Deuteronomy. Moshe gives us three final speeches that sets us on a path toward wholeness and toward holiness, including the words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your might, with all your soul, with all your being, through the mitzvot, through fulfillment of the commandments. 
when Moses has attained knowledge of his mortality, it's actually when he rises to the highest level of his morality. When I finally came back up from air on this vacation and the cell phone came back to work again and I got caught up on the news, I saw that we have questions of morality from our southernmost borders to New York and the United Nations to what's happening around the world, including and especially with our brothers and sisters in Israel. Questions of morality abound today. Our Torah portion this week, Parshat Chukan, challenges us, reminds us that no one is immune from death not even Moshe Rabbeinu. And in that no one is immune from death, we are all that much more obligated to be mindful of our own short span of years on earth. And perhaps even more so, those all around us and their shortness of life as well. This week of Parashat Fukat, the connection between morality and mortality are called to be answered. This week of Parshat Kukat, as we transcend by eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and we transcend our own reality, our own simplicity in the Garden of Eden, we are asked to find a balance between self-preservation and caring for others. This week of Parashat Kukat, we are forced to wrestle with mortality and thus with our morality. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you over the course of this morning and into lunch as I ask you, what is that question? Why does the knowledge of good and evil require us to have a shortness of life on this earth? Shabbat Shalom.